G'day, everyone. How's it going? Uh, today, I've got Blair Fraser. You probably already know him from the Maintenance Disrupted uh, podcast. Uh, Blair also works at uh, UE Systems. And, um, you know, through his work, um, he's obviously been to, to many sites all over the world, but also through the podcast, he's getting uh, gets so much exposure to, um, you know, people from all sorts of, of fields within the maintenance industry. And so I think he's got some really fascinating insights to share. Um, partially because of the breadth of knowledge that he has. Uh, and that's one of the things that I'm really enjoying about having interview guests is that I get to learn as much as possible. And so someone who's been doing it as long as Blair has, um, has a, a lot of knowledge to draw on. So uh, Blair, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, absolute pleasure, Rafe. It's always, it's always interesting being on someone else's podcast and just, I'm just going to sit back and cruise control and let you steer this ship. It's fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I, I guess maybe just to open, I, I just wanted to get your take on really the, the state of ma maintenance as it stands today. You know, um, I think, you know, it's a bit of a hot topic, uh, particularly, you know, in the U S we've got, uh, president Biden trying to push th through this, you know, massive infrastructure bill, which I think in many ways has kind of shone a light on maybe the lack of maintenance that's been going mm -hmm. on in a lot of industries. Um, so, you know, just in, in your experience and you've been around it for a while now, like, how do you think maintenance is just generally viewed, whether it's by the public or, or within the industry? So two ways of looking at that. And, and when I look at maintenance, you know, I can't look at maintenance and not think about the greater picture of maintenance where it fits into asset management. And, you know, I, I don't look at maintenance as just a maintenance group, but it, it's more yeah. involved in that. So when I answer that, it's typically in that context, but there's, there's two things. One is, you know, I don't think anyone's going to disagree is traditionally maintenance has been seen as a cost center, right? It's, it's a, it's a necessary evil that you have to do in order to make sure, right. To, you can get your, your product or output through, right. Where I think things are changing is being driven from you know, industry 4.0. So industry 4.0 is actually a, it's a, it's a timeline, right? People can, can sometimes confuse it with a, with technology. Industry 4.0 is just, it's a, it's a, it's a place in time. Just like industry 3.0 was, you know, when we started to automate things and you go back all the way to the steam engine, it doesn't, doesn't define the technology. It's just a state of time, right? And really what that's moving to is, you know, the tools like IOT and, and things like that. And the reason I think it's shining a new light on maintenance while they're saying it incorrectly, and I'd say they, those are typically people that <laughs> haven't come to our industry, uh, consultants, the big four, those people, is because, um, you know, quote unquote, predictive maintenance or maintenance 4.0 is the biggest driver for artificial intelligence, IoT, those things. So it's making us, and I say us as maintenance people, more valuable because if the promise of all this new technology at the low hanging fruit is maintenance. They can't implement these solutions without maintenance domain expertise. So it's putting us in a different light. I don't think we've ever been in before, right? You can bring the smartest data scientist, AI person, um, never step foot in the plant. And that person is generally useless unless you combine them with someone that has the experience, the domain expertise, and that typically comes from, from maintenance and come from operations and other places, right? So generally what I'm seeing is a very positive intake or uh, uptake in, in how maintenance people are, are being viewed. Now it doesn't stop any challenges from a shortage of maintenance, uh, from a shortage of skilled trades being developed at a younger age, which is probably a whole other podcast that I'm passionate about. Right. So there is going to be this gap, but at least it's starting to see that maintenance is not a cost center. It, it has a big play in a bigger picture and is a value add to an organization. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And, and one of the themes that you spoke to, I know that's probably a, a whole standalone podcast is the idea of attracting, uh, talent to the industry too. Um, you know, something I think I've felt specifically in, uh, lubricants and lubrication technology is it's not really, uh, how, how do you want to say this? It's not really, it's not a sexy industry, right? It's not, it's, uh, not. it's not tech. Is effectively no. what I'm saying. And unfortunately, right. a lot of the skill sets overlap. Like if you've got strong STEM skills, you're pretty good with problem solving, maths, science, physics, 
the the natural inclination is for people to go into tech because that seems to be That's where true. you know the job opportunities are, where the money is, and all that kind of stuff. So we're kind of competing for the same talent in a lot of ways, um, and so it, it's quite hard to get people to 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 want to do work, quote unquote, in the real world rather than in the in the cloud. No, it, it, you're you're exactly <laughs> the trade is in in the cloud, and that's that's exactly it. Is the skill set needed on both sides? Um, like we've we've, um, uh, and I'll tell a story here. When um, I did a, a founded a startup in artificial intelligence, dealing specifically with um, industrial uh, manufacturing, and as we were acquiring our head of data science, um, you know. It, it was his maturity that realized he was, you know, he, he could work for, for Google, any of those big companies. Right. And to him was, he, he realized that in order for AI to scale, he can go work for these big companies and, and, and probably get paid a lot, lot more, but in order to really make impact with what he's going to do, he has a better chance working at a small organization with domain experts to make that happen. Now with that, we had that talent and we were acquiring others people from STEM and we were competing against companies and there's nothing wrong with this. I think it's great because any competition I always believe is good, but you know, well, I have an opportunity to work at Google or, or SpaceX. So I'm like, dang, that does sound cool. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, they're like, wait, you know, what, what, what would, you know, what, why should I work here and not there? I'm like, I'll build you a slide if that's what we need to do. Right. It yep. goes down into a ball pit, but <laughs> right. Um, but hopefully yeah, the, the, the impact of doing something, um, you know, I, I think it's more tangible, not, not to say that sending billionaires into space is not needed, but, um, right. Um, uh, <laughs> so there, there is a big issue with that, with, uh, with re developing and retaining talent is a big issue that's going to face us across, you know, asset management, maintenance and everything like that. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's a bit of a dual challenge there that you might be able to speak a little bit to, because one of it is trying to get talent, new talent into these, these industries, you know, whether it is asset management or, you know, condition monitoring, lubricant technology, whatever, whatever it is. And then probably the other challenge is for the existing people within, within the industry, trying to build up their, you know, tech skills for want of a better mm -hmm. word, you know, data analytics, their understanding of, you know, cloud computing and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, how are you seeing that? if you like education piece happening in the industry. Yeah. Two very separate problems. And I believe different solutions to solve those problems. So the first yeah. one is acquiring new talent. And I think that's why it's important as someone in maintenance to adopt new technology, to make it attractive. So yep. if you're still out there taking like there's in my belief now that there's always obviously reasons and, and things that, that I can't see, but if you're still doing manual work orders, walking around with a pen and paper and things like that, like that's kind of some low hanging fruit. Then, you know, mm. that's not really digital transformation. That's just digitizing something that should be digitized. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, and I always make this joke, you go into a pharmaceutical plant and because of quote unquote compliance rules, they can't chase their printer. So they're still using a dot matrix printer. Right. But they use that as a, as a, as a crutch. Well, we can't, the FDA is not going to allow that. Pretty sure they're yeah. going to allow a new printer, but. You know, so you still see dot matrix printers, right? But then they're spending millions and billions on transforming uh, the other side of the process. So, you know, to get that new talent, you have to invest in talents. And, and the reality is to some of the most successful projects I've done have, you know, those you call them millennials, whatever you want, that new generation that learns by you to, uh, you know, fundamentally gets it and they can see this to technology different than a lot of us can, mm -hmm. right? And I think, you know, if there's a roadmap of, of a company trying to invest in technology and they can help influence, then that's going to start to attract some, some of the younger talent into this field. Right. And the, the other part is around, you know, updating, upgrading existing people's knowledge. Right. Yeah. And some can be a leap, right. You think maintenance has traditionally been a pen and paper wrench toolbox kind of job. Right. And, and I could speak to that because I've been that right. And. You know, even as the pandemic hit, we switched all of our meetings to teams, even getting people just to join a teams meeting, right? You spent the first half hour, yeah, you're on mute, do this, yep. do this, right? Um, and it, so there is a fundamental skill 
gap that's that's there, right? It's not the it's not the result of, of someone not willing or trying. It just hasn't been their core competency. So depending how far that gap is depends on that. But what is what is great, and I'll give you credit for this, is there's companies that are trying to bridge that gap between an all out expert and just having a general knowledge to make educational decisions, right? So you don't yep. have to be, we have to get across this. We don't have to be an expert in everything. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, and so enough knowledge, so you can speak intelligently to it and understand when someone's talking, but you still rely on a true subject matter expert to do that. And you know, what you're doing with, with lubrication, trying to bridge that gap between a full on, you know, well-educated lubrication expert. And someone that goes out there, but still needs a fundamental training because they're greasing the bearings they are going to make decisions. And the same can be applied for, for new technology. I don't think it makes sense for anyone that's currently in maintenance to go back and get a data science degree. You, you're yep. more than welcome to go back for 10 years of school and, you know, brush off your calculators and do that kind of stuff, but it's not going to add any value to your organization. You could do it personally, but to your organization, I don't think it's going to be a value, but I do think it's important you understand or that they understand the basics of, of data science, how analytics works. You, 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 I'm not, I don't think they should ever say, you know, explain to me a regression model and how it works or a decision yeah. tree, right? That that's too far, but at least know there's, well, there's some methods out there that maybe we can do this data. Let me get someone in, in to do that. And there's, uh, you know, I'm working with, um, the university on developing that framework, those courses from an IOT perspective to get people the fundamental knowledge to take that next step. Now they're always welcome to take it from that step into true academia world and, mm -hmm. and, you know, take those advanced courses where you walk out with a degree or a diploma. But I think it's going to be important that, um, companies continue to invest in that fundamental knowledge. And also the way we give the learning, I think is going to influence things. Gone are the days where you're going to pull someone off the job floor for five days, sit in here, PowerPoint to death and learn this, right? We've got to get away from that. That's proven not to work. Um, we mm -hmm. have to get into, you know, video learning, what, uh, many people blended learning, a little bit of hands-on, a little bit of theory and, and do, do better at offering those type of programs for people who can still do their job, but then get educated at the same time. Yeah, it does. It does feel in some ways, I, I know this is, it's no one's fault, right? It's a, it's a function of how training used to be delivered in, in person, right? You had, you know, you had to get everyone to take, you know, two, three days off, um, and, and kind of sit down with a trainer and, mm -hmm. and do that training. But I think the, the, maybe the unfortunate side effect of it is that basically a lot of the trainers were kind of, uh, teaching to pass the exam, right? Cause you'd often do like a two or three day course oh, yeah. and then, yeah. and then you see the exam afterwards, but as soon as you finished, you know, you put your pen down, you probably forgot, <clears throat> you know. 80% of all the knowledge that you learned over That's the previous right. three days <laughs> and it sort of lost that utility. Um, and, and I do like, you know, the, the, the slow creep of a lot of these learning methods, which is sort of a bit more integrated into your everyday experience. Um, I think that that is going to be interesting just to maybe pick up on, on one thing that you talked about there with, uh, you know, IOT for anyone that's not familiar, internet of things, right? So we're not just talking about, you know, a, a fridge that can talk to you when your milk's gone off, but, but, sure. you know, sensor technology and, um, you know, uh, taking a lot of the technology basically that we've had for a really long time, whether it's vibration sensors or, you know, used oil analysis testing and, and really just kind of taking that data in real time and making sure that it's all consolidated in a single place. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, my only question about that is, is the industry putting the cart before the horse a little bit? Um, in that, uh, IOT, I think holds a lot of promise, but in many areas of our industry, it feels like we still haven't got the fundamentals, right? right. So, you know, it, I can speak to my own experience with lubrication technologies. Um, you know, I, I can talk on this channel, uh, as long as I want about really cool additive packages and all this new technology, but you know, 90% of the lube techs that I meet don't understand how contamination affects, let's say a hydraulic pack, right? And so we're, we're having to educate at that level for people to, to gain an understanding. Um, 
it almost feels like to make the jump to internet of things is a huge investment, right? In both time to set it up as well as cost. And are you going to really reap the benefits when the, the fundamentals aren't there? So maybe you can talk, cause that's sort of a dual challenge, right? Of trying to get the fundamentals right while at the same time, bringing the industry into the tree, <laughs> into the modern age. Yeah, it feels like you both have to happen at the same time, but how do you accomplish that when there's two very, very different levels of understanding? That's true. And, um, I'm going to disagree with most. Okay. And, 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 uh, I'll, I'll tell you why, and, and I'm subject to, to being wrong, of course. So, um, you, you're absolutely right. So the, I'm going to preface the whole conversation with this statement. Technology is not a linear adoption. Yeah. Okay. And, and what I mean by that, if you look at, um, you know, cell phones and, and my kids are starting to get their first cell phones and, you know, they didn't have rotary phones you know, experience that or, or even internet, they just expect the internet to work. Right. Mm -hmm. In my generation, I didn't get, um, internet until later on in life. And it's going to date me. And you know, it was dial up, right. And you don't need to just sit on a phone call and <laughs> just kick, kick you off the internet. Right. Yeah. And you know, um, full board systems, everyone remembers that, but, um, uh, so, you know, just cause my kids haven't experienced that doesn't mean they cannot take full advantage of the internet. True. Um, so it's not, it's not a linear adoption, but of course, with anything, you have to have some level of foundation for anything to stand up, no matter what the technology you have to have some kind of foundation. Now, is there, you know, when it comes to IOT, is there a, you know, a certain, these are what you must have. And I've pondered this for years. And specifically, as I looked at, you know, quote unquote, predictive maintenance, uh, maintenance for low, whatever you want to call it. So IOT for maintenance, predicting equipment failures, let's call it that. And, you know, I was looking at the, the pillars of SMRP as looking at the uptime elements, all these references out there that say, this is what a good program should have. And I started staring at these saying, which ones are, do you have to have, or at least a portion in order for this to stand up? And I couldn't answer that consistently because it depended on the people and it depended on the problem you're going to solve. Right. And what I found is there's two, there's two dividing worlds and there's people that bridge the gap. There's the technology people that say, you know, probably what I'm saying is, is, uh, you know, technology can help, help build some of that foundation, um, which is not entirely true. And then you have, you know, the, I just call them the white hairs, but the, the consultants that have been around for a long, long time that are going to really preach, you know, don't worry about AI. That's so far down, focus on this, focus on these fundamentals. And there's a, there's a danger in both. So if mm -hmm. you go too fast with technology, and I've seen this time and time again, our guests have shared some experience with this. Um, now it's not too often we highlight failures, right? No one's going to come on a podcast. Look how bad I failed and my <laughs> company failed at doing this. Right. So you don't hear those stories. Yeah. Right. But you do inter you start talking to people outside of it. Right. But it never gets on air and gets out there. Right. So there is a danger of absolutely moving too fast. And a great example of that, you mentioned wireless vibration is, um, I did a, a presentation, a keynote presentation, and I had one slide up there, the entire presentation and said 97% of our manufacturing data is not used. Right. So here we are strapping things to things to make more data. Like we're, we're trying to fill that 3% gap. We want hundred percent of our data not used now. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, why are we creating more data when we're not using the data we have? Could we solve problems in that data that already exists? And the chances are yes. But the caveat to that is maybe we're not asking the right questions in order to get insights from that data. And I truly believe we don't need better ways of collecting data, moving data around. We just need better ways of asking our questions. Right. Yeah. And better questions to ask. So that sort of speaks to, I think I, I saw you say, oh, I can't remember. Maybe it was on LinkedIn or something. Oh, no, it was on a recent podcast, I think. Where oh, what I say? It was uh, <laughs> about talking about the analogy that data is the new gold. Right. Right. And I think you kind of made the point That's where right. you said, well, not really. It's, it's the insights. That's right. Insights is the, the gold. data, which is, yes. which is the new gold. Right. And, um, and it's funny because when I was listening to that podcast, uh, uh, in my head, I was, I was thinking, yeah, that's absolutely true. And actually, if I had to sort of modify the analogy so that it fits a little bit better, I would describe actually data as being the new oil in so much as like oil itself, when you pull it out of the ground, 
it has value, right? You can, you, whatever the oil price is, 60, 70 bucks mm -hmm. a barrel or whatever. But the product itself is actually not useful until you refine it. Correct. So it's almost like it, data itself, yeah, it has a store of value, but it's sitting there and it's not usable until, you know, you apply that level of insight it. to it. And, it, and it, I think it speaks to our industry background. So I use the mining example. I say data is the iron ore. Yes. And then <laughs> and the insights is when you yeah, process yeah. it and you get your gold. But yeah, um, no, so it, that's exactly it. So it, there is a caution on both sides. If you focus, tell me a customer that has the foundations perfect. Yep. Right. So if you wait until you have best in class metrics for planning and scheduling work order prioritization, you have an RCM done on your critical assets, you have an FME done on your, your, your essential assets, those type of things that everyone preaches, you are never going to get to technology. I have yet, and I've, I've been to some of the best, you know, that they're getting close and there's, you know, there's a few companies that have got really darn close, um, you know, to that best in class. Right. But it, it's a moving target. It's, it's mm -hmm. you know, it's going to go up and down. So, so but it's almost caveat, like, don't, it, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Or, or yes. Yeah. Don't let perfect get in the way of done is what I always say. But, um, so there's an example. If you wait until you have best in class planning and scheduling, then you're probably waiting too late to take advantage of what technology can do for you. But on the other side, if you put sensors out there, and that's what I, I've told people over decades now of putting sensors on things. And this started with my career in industry 3.0, pressure, temperature level, things like that, is when you go looking, you're going to find things. And sometimes you don't want to know they exist, right? Um, <laughs> ignorance can be bliss sometimes. So if I give you an alert that this needs lubrication, are right, you going to go lube it? Because if you're not, do you have the system in there to send someone, are they going to go lube it right? Right? Because if the answer is no, then it's just a bad circle. I'll take your money. Yeah. Yeah. But you're not going to like it because it ain't going to work. Right. And so, you know, so there is, there is a balance between the foundations and, and I don't preach either way. Um, I, I do believe, you know, when I talk about technology and IOT, I've seen large, huge companies try to do what I call boil the ocean strategies, um, got teams and millions of dollars together to, you know, improve recovery by 1% or something like that. Right. And fundamentally fail. Um, so the boil the ocean strategy almost never works. Now I've, I've seen it works. Well, I've seen it from a marketing perspective work. I don't know behind the, if you actually open the hood, if it, if it worked. Um, and the way I tell people is there's not one size fits all. So just because another sister plan of yours, which may be identical implemented, doesn't mean it's going to work for you. There's different mm -hmm. nuances. There's different people, um, things like that. So it, and, and also invest in the, I, I, you know, my time in the startup taught me a lot about, um, hedging your bets, uh, right. And a lot about rejection as well, but, uh, is. You know, I tell people, think like a venture capitalist. If, you, if people don't know what that means, as people that are investing, they invest in 10 companies knowing that eight are going to fail flat, but those two are hopefully going to be a huge success, right? Yep. So, you know, vibration is not the end of the, is not going to solve all your problems. And I'm an ultrasound. Ultrasound is not going to solve all your problems. Like, right. It, it, it's, there's no magic pill yet, um, but it's, it's, it's getting darn close, right? Mm. Um, so, yeah. Be cautious about waiting too long for your fundamentals, but you do need enough. And then be cautious about putting technology in it at a face, at a pace faster than your foundation can, can keep up. Yeah. So interesting. So interesting. Um, all right. Well, maybe we can pivot a little bit to, uh, just talk about some of your experiences talking to people on the podcast. Um, I just want to know what some of the, the really cool technology that you that you've been exposed to um, yeah I, uh, oh there's gosh. so much right there's there's so much but if you could you know even just pick a handful maybe even not necessarily that has application today but some of the stuff that you've talked about which might be on the horizon and 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 might be coming in the future yeah and and that's one of my faults is i i hate to take on the potential uh i yeah. just love <laughs> i love technology and and things like that so um, yeah, so th th there's been some great, great interviews, some, some great insights. And one that's always struck me, um, and the, the name's going to pass me now, uh, I can, I can send it to you after just so you can put it in the show notes, but, uh, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say it wrong is there was a company that 
I came across, I want to say now five to eight years ago, and this speaks to the foundation and where technology could fit into the foundation. And what it was, was, um, asset master data. So, you know, one of the things when you start reliability and you're looking at maintenance is knowing what you have, mm -hmm. I have this many motors or this type, right. And collecting that data specifically on a, 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 a brownfield site can be very, very difficult. And in fact, I ran projects through a consulting firm where we did this, where we put people out in the field and just walked around and collected data. It's and basically a it. giant audit, right? It's a giant audit, but the, the danger is you can't just send anybody into the field. Otherwise I would have just grabbed people off the street and said, yeah, go they don't write know what down nameplates. They don't know. Well, what's that? I'm like, well, that's the pressure relief valve. That's a steam. I'm like, oh gosh. Okay. Well, I'm doing myself. Right. Yeah, yeah. So you need some education. So we came across this company that. Um, uses three technologies. They're using AI, image recognition, tech recognition, and a, in a, in a, a crowdsourcing where you simply take a picture and it's going to try to recognize as much image as it can. But then in, in, in brownfield sites, a three can look like an eight, right? If that metal things wear, you know, wear off, like is it a three, is it an eight? So they'll crowdsource it, they'll put it out there and say, here's 20 people. What do you think it is? Right. Right. And that gets you in the ballpark, but also they have a manufacturer's database. So if it's your Fisher valve, it, this product number can't have a three in it because it doesn't exist. So it must be an eight, but all that's automated. Right. So you did, so you can really send anybody in there. It's going to take a picture. You can recognize, Hey, this is a gene trap. This is a valve. Right. So that was one that's always stuck out for me because it's so obvious. It's one of those ones. Like I wish I, I should have started a company and thought of that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so that, that's one that's always stand out that hopefully people are, and, and we had them on the podcast are taking advantage of that, um, that, that company that, uh, did, did get, uh, bought out, which, which happens in our industry. Right. And, and, uh, an another one is the, um, augmented worker. Um, I probably have one sitting around here with real wear. There's other places that are augmenting, uh, our, our ability. And it's not from a fact, like if you look at Google glasses and things like that, why that fundamentally flopped, I can talk about too, but. Yeah. The idea of, okay, pull up this manual and things like that. And you can scroll through it with an eyepiece and which is great, but we're, I've seen it very successful. And I think this was now a huge advantage for anyone that implemented this prior to the pandemic is the remote worker. It had a camera yeah. built into it. So you can see what you can see. Right. And as an OEM, I can't tell you how many people said, Hey, can you fly here and take a look at this? I'm like, no. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Can you take some pictures? Well, I'll take a bit like, this, you can see what that person can see. Okay. Move that wire. Wait, what was that? Right. And you're essentially there with that person. Right. And I think that is a underserved area. Yeah. And I, then, I was, uh, at the, at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, you know, real wear or similar type headset adoption wasn't uh, that, that high, certainly yeah. in, in my markets in, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and there were a few instances where we needed to do that kind of remote exactly, inspection. Yeah. And I was doing the sort of the, the MacGyver job where I'd get them to strap a GoPro to their, to yeah, their exactly. helmet. Exactly. And have it hooked yeah. up, have it hooked up to their phone on the 3G signal. And it was, oh, it, yeah. was, it was, uh, it was pretty messy, but you know, it, it got the job done. It got um, the job done. So, but, but, it, the, but the real wear implementation, you, you know, even with the integration into the hard hat and integration with mm. like Microsoft teams and stuff has, has, uh, it's definitely a step up, right? Um, and even, even on a basic level, whatever software they have for stabilizing the image while the person is walking around, that that's really helpful. Cause otherwise that's you, right. watching the you screen, you start to get, to get sick. Yeah. You need a barf bag from an airplane yeah. as you're troubleshooting it. And, and no, that, and that speaks to what can work in, um, other industries. And, and the analogy I always give is smart cities. Mm. It is really darn, cause you're in a city to begin with, to put a bunch of sensors on a building and send that signal out. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's different when you're in a manufacturing facility. Um, there's a lot more security compliance. We have networks in there, things like that. So it's different. And I'll you know, use real wear as an example, but there's no ties to them, but you know, even just the way they can, um, cut out background noise. Yeah. Right. Like it, it does industrial environment. Nothing's pretty about where we work. No. There's a few industries I can think that are nice and clean, but most of them are, they're, they're loud, they're dangerous, they're dirty. Right. And if you're trying to talk to someone and there's a motor that all you're going to hear is the motor, but they can yeah. cancel that out. Right. Um, so, so yeah, so that, that, that's a great example of, of one that I think, uh, will, 
you know, hopefully it's being adopted well and, and we'll continue to do that as, you know, we're going to start to realize. And that's what, um, the pandemic really taught me as well is maybe I didn't need to go to site or didn't know to get to that meeting as much as I did, um, before I, I'm always going to be a fan of face to face. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe it'll challenge that a bit and specifically as we have, um, diminishing experts in maintenance, getting them access to these younger people to mentor, even though they're not physically there is going to be a huge, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, huge I think that is going to be a, a massive challenge. And what, what's, I think is, is a bit interesting, um, about how the pandemic has kind of shaken out is in some ways it does place a lot more emphasis on, um, the, the field techs having a, a bit of a step up in their level of knowledge too. Because a lot of organizations seem to have moved to this hybrid model where a lot of your expertise may sit centrally in an office, right? So a lot of the mining companies, for example, in Australia have set up like a center of excellence in Perth where they have all their experts, right? And then you've got the field techs that are in really remote locations and they're giving feedback, right? To the, to a lot of the engineers that are are based in a major city, Mm -hmm. but those engineers they very rarely get an opportunity to actually go out and, and touch and listen to the equipment and, right. and see it. And there, there's so many things that you can pick up from being next to a, a bit of equipment that you're, Absolutely. that you sit around on a regular basis. Um, so it's a, yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting challenge for the industry as well as that, that sort of split in responsibilities too. Right. Yeah. And the end of the day, we're going to, we're going to need people out in the field. Um, I'm a, Believer of that, no matter how good the technology gets, there's, yeah. there's something about a human walking around using our senses and, and gut feel, right. And I, I've, I've, I've challenged and I've, I've, sometimes I've won, sometimes I failed that, you know, 40 year maintenance person that can hear the sound, use a screwdriver to his ear and go, oh, that bearing's starting to fail. I'm like, yeah, right. And then I put our measurement coming on. I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. Darn it. Um, and that's the thing, yeah, they're so using intuition, right? It, it, it may not, right. they may not necessarily be able to point exactly to what the failure mode is, but, but they know that something's up, but right. it requires it, that, more investigation. And, and that goes back to your foundation. And that's when I start to look at technology and I always ask people to start with a question, right? Yeah. If, if specifically from a, a, a maintenance point of view, if you're going to start with technology, if you could walk up to that piece of equipment, what would you ask it? Yeah. Right. They're like, when are you going to fail? Like you selfish. No. What would you ask it? Right. Um, okay. You know, do you need anything from me? I'm like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. What do you think this could possibly need? Oh, I might need grease. I might need food. I might need a clean. Like, and that starts to get to, you know, further you go down that wormhole is where your technology should, should lead. Right. Um, and then working on the, the, and it ties up with the, the foundation on the other side. Right. And then, so, yeah, so we, you know, the, the, image recognition of, of walk downs using technology there, the connected worker, which is more than just the, the, the remote worker too. It's connecting worker from a health and safety point of view. Um, you know, I'm sure you've been in many environments where you have to wear H2S sensors and, and things like that. There's no point with today's technology that, you know, th- one of the issues is, you know, you don't want big brother always watching you where you are. Right. And I, I understand that but you can't un- anonymize the data and stuff like that. But if you ever did have an incident, you know, just like we always monitor safety showers when they go off, send a crew out, right? Um, you know, those type of things. So anybody, anywhere, if you ever get in danger, you should not be alone, right? And it really should have a big impact on, on safety with this technology. And one of the biggest ones, and th- this is bias from my opinion, is the use of artificial intelligence, right? And, you know, it can scare a lot of people off because of the word artificial intelligence. And I've had people, ah, do you actually know the meaning of where artificial intelligence came from? I don't care. Right. What, what I'm worried about, what I'm more concerned about is, is the outcome of it. Right. And, you know, artificial intelligence is, it's, it's technically been around, you know, the the algorithms part of it since sixties and seventies. Right. What's really, what's changed is our ability to create these quote unquote models and, and, and and get value from it, right? Gone are the days of needing this superpower computer to do this, right? And I think where the promise of this technology lies is is not in the AI, but it's in the domain expertise and AI combined, right? 
to, to build these. They're not building the silo. And this, this might go off topic for a lot of people, but uh, I came from the automation space and we had, you know, what's called fuzzy logic, model predictive control, expert systems for, for years. And it's running across all plants and they fundamentally failed. And why they failed, because it was someone's logic um, that wasn't adaptive to the variations in the process, Dude. right? So as long as your raw materials stay the same, as long as the ore you're crushing stay in the same, as long as the crew is still this consistency, this will work, right? Um, and I think that's where AI is going to have the biggest impact. Our, our ability for us to, um, we don't need to know how we're going to train these models, how it works in the background, but what we want to do is test and be able to deploy artificial intelligence. So the easiest, what I've learned from that is the easiest use of that is Yes, you want to, you know, everyone wants to get to this remaining useful life and that's where the marketing is going to, Hey, with this, you know, I, I've actually sat through an AI presentation where the speaker and he was, he was respected, um, said with our technology using AI, you'll never have a failure again. Right. And I was in this crowd of people. I think I was the only maintenance reliability person in this crowd because all the rest were, uh, you know, people outside of that field. Right. And I'm looking around like, is anyone else going to call BS on this? Right. <laughs> I'm like, never, I was like, I'm biting my time. I'm like, don't do it. No, you let him go. And eventually I'm, so I put on my hand. I'm like, what about a lightning strike? Yeah. Can yep. you predict a lightning strike hitting this and taking down my equipment? Right. Like, well, no, no, that's an act of God. Still a failure. Yeah. What about the operator that's not trained? Right. That goes and puts the wrong grease in. Well, right. Yeah. No, well, no, but eventually it'll affect the bearing and then it'll fail and we'll pick it up. Like you're not really preventing that, but I, I didn't mean to be rude or anything, right? It's just that, that concept, right? And that remaining useful life is where people want to get to. You have 11 days, you know, two hours and 63 minutes, well, I guess you wouldn't have 63 minutes for this to fail, right? And that's the holy grail. Yes. Can you get some level of accuracy, right? But we've been using AI for weather and how often are they right? Mm -hmm. Right. And they have the biggest data set. Right? We've been tracking weather for so long. We still, every now and then, get caught by surprise. Hey, when's it supposed to rain? And it's poor, right? Yeah. Or it's supposed to rain and it's sunny and you take it for granted. But um, so the biggest issue there is looking at where it can apply. And that's where I think people take logical steps. If you were just to take that 97% of data that's not used, apply it to one piece of equipment, and it was just to tell you, sift through that data. So an average human can look at four data points before we start to create smoke in our head and can stop making correlations in that data, right? If AI can help us get that fifth, sixth, seventh variable, hey, I notice every time that John Smith is the operator, the weather is this, 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 then this happens, right? And that's where AI, it doesn't need to be predicting things in the future with a high level of certainty, but just going through those patterns, identifying things that we can't see because we don't have the time and we don't have the mental capacity to do it, to guide us, just to guide us, say, hey, this temperature is anomalous by 86%, right? Just so you know, right? And then you get an experienced person, hey, that is interesting, right? And start to do the correlations. And I think AI is going to, um, whether we will keep on calling it AI, call it, you know, it, technically pattern recognition is a form of AI, but not what I was talking about. But, um, you know, those type of, of lower hanging fruit, we should really start to implement more, right? Instead of going for that, holy grail of remaining useful life and solving all of our world problems with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. And it also speaks to maybe the thing that we, we had at the very beginning of this uh, talk where having, you know, legacy engineers and maintenance professionals get an understanding of the underlying technology, right? So, cause AI right. can sometimes be a bit of a scary term. And if, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it almost seems like magic. Right. It's, it's kind That's of right. like this, this voodoo thing. It's like a black box. I put data in it, it spits stuff back out again. I don't really understand how it works, but you know, fundamentally the, the, the principles behind AI are not, they're not completely alien, but you, you know, I no, think exactly. uh, most they're... people with the maths and science background would be able to understand. They may not be able to, to write code, right. <laughs> that would, you know, but, but I think it's, uh, it's readily explainable at least. And so That's at least right. you can get an understanding of, of what the data engine is doing. And therefore, you know, when it spits you back out answers, what are you supposed right. to do with that? And the key to it is having the data available and clean for it, right? You can Oof. do all these experiments offline. 
um, because you clean that data set, streaming real time data and, and, you know, what's called ETL prepping that data is the biggest part. And this was one of my most interesting podcasts and probably our lowest ratings was I did one on a unified namespace and this intrigued me and what the concept is, is around this unified namespace where, you know, the, the, the way it was described to me is what one node knows, all nodes know, yeah. right? And it was this architecture, if anyone knows field bus, it was back in that day where decentralized control and this is talking to this, but it doesn't have to talk to this to talk to that, right? So purchasing systems, maintenance systems, ERP, they all get the information they need from this unified namespace, right? And it is different from a data lake or data warehouse, and it's really structured data. And that is really what I think we need to get, whether you call the unified namespace or, you know, a data lake, or data warehouse, but getting it where you don't have to manage it, your data coming in where it automatically gets transformed and clean. So it's available for you to do analytics is, is I think going to be the biggest, uh, hurdle we need to get through. AI is really a secondary step in order to getting our data in the right spot, nice and clean for us to use. Yeah. Um, as we, as we sort of start to wrap up here, maybe, um, if I could ask you a question just about the guests specifically that you've had on the podcast. Um, so you've been able to talk pretty much with like the best of the best, right? In, in our industry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's yeah, one absolutely. of the advantages of having a show like this is you get to learn off some really oh, uh, fantastic professionals, you know, in the, uh, in the industry. So are there any, let's say underlying threads that, that you've been able to pull from, uh, people who have been successful in the, in the maintenance and asset management field? Is there, is there maybe a way that they ask questions or approach technical concepts or the way that they explain things? Are there any sort of. Yeah. Common threads between them that you've, you've seen. Yeah. So, so those people that, um, have, have really resonated well with me and our audience and you, you can see it in literally when you look at our listener accounts, right? Yeah. Right. Um, not only by the number of listeners, cause people will trunk through a, a, a podcast, whether they're just li- doing something else and it's just playing, but you know, we get metrics to how long, um, the average listener is listening for it. Right. So you can, you get an idea of people are jumping off within the first few minutes like that, a speaker. So there are a few where, where people have been very successful. Now this isn't I mean, everybody has to be this, but what I'm finding is if they're an end user, they end up being a very good internal salesman. They can position what mm-hmm. they're trying to do and accomplish the value of what they're trying to do very eloquently. Um, it, 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 and, and, you know, almost be constantly pitching because, you know, we get that asked a lot, like, how do I justify the spend in this to do this one, you know, and, and so they end up being their own internal salesman and, and advocate. And, and the, the second part is, um, the passion that they have for this space yeah. while generally, you know, we're comparing it to other quote unquote, more sexy industries, but there are people in this space that bring so much passion to this. You can't help not to be contagious. Yeah. Just to, just to go like, ah, like Sonny is one of them. Like try, try to, to make lubrication boring with her. You can't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, so then there's so many people like that, that have those niches, have that passion. And when they have passion, it comes out, you make a better salesperson. And also what I found is those people that have the, the largest success inside of their organization are on a continuous learning journey. They never stop. Never once have I heard them say, I'm an expert in this, mm. right? They're like, I'm still learning. I'm trying to mm. learn every nook and cranny, right? Sonia's two books now in, I consider her an expert, but she'll say, no, I'm still learning, right? Yeah. I bring on Blair, the expert on lubrication. I'm like, what are you talking about, Sonia? Yeah. Right? Uh, but, so the, there's an example. They're always, they're always learning, right? And then on the, on the, you know, the vendor, the technology side, it, it, it's similar right? Is those people that bring passion, but have a willingness to understand that they don't know it all. They know their space really well. Um, and where I found it in, and this is no fault of the companies, but we've had companies from large, you know, enterprise fortune 500 technology to, you know, someone in their garage with an idea of starting it up. And I, I welcome both with, with open arms, um, is, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's people coming into our space outside of our field. And I mean that they've, they've 
you know, but come on. And then like, I want to talk about why predictive maintenance is good. I'm like, that's a great idea, but we did that topic 10 years ago. Yeah. Yep. Like, well, did you, you know that predictive maintenance can say, yes, I, I understand that you're entering our field and you just found this out. Yeah. But our, our listeners and we all know, most of us know that, you know, yes, we need to get better at this. We need to get better at that. Right. Um, so it's, it's interesting seeing people come in outside of our industry and, and this, this, this can happen from, you know, big, big companies that are trying to, you know, I often say if you, if you've seen companies that before used to sell you stuff for your email, and now they're talking to you about manufacturing and you can start to guess what I'm talking about. And they got shiny new boots on and a hard hat that's crystal clean, right? Because they're now responsible and they understand that manufacturing has the most data out of any other entity, including government. Yep. Manufacturing generates more data than any other industry in this world. So when it, data is the gold, it's the crude coming up where they're going to go after. They want to capture all that crude. So, you know, we're starting to see people that want to educate us on our space, even though we've been in the space, which I always find, find interesting. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Well, um, Blair, I think that's a, that's a great place to end it. Um, thanks so much for, uh, sharing, you know, a lot of your insight, both, you know, your own experience in, in the maintenance field, as well as, uh, the experience that you've kind of, um, accumulated by osmosis, let's say <laughs> through, <laughs> through all the interviews. I'm, I'm just a huge fan of, of what you guys do at maintenance disrupted. Um, I think it's, it's fascinating. And for anyone who's listening to this on. I guess on the lubrication explain channel and hasn't checked out, out maintenance disrupted it's you know available on all the uh standard podcast platforms so definitely go and, and check them out because there is a uh a significant back catalog let's say <laughs> that's <laughs> right and so if you haven't listened to any of the episodes then you've got about a week of binge listening to do so um uh yeah definitely definitely check it out but yeah thanks so much blair and and uh, we'll talk to you soon my pleasure. Thanks, Ray.